Roman Caesars and Christianity. Many of the things happening today, and much that will happen in the near future, because of the events among which we are now moving, will be seen in their true light if, with thoughtful understanding, we keep in view the later course of those events resulting from the early spread of Christianity. This may sound paradoxical at the present day. It is hardly possible to make the generality of people understand how certain forces entered into and made a profound impression on the whole course of the evolution of the earth and of man, and that these forces are still to be seen at work, especially in our time. The reason is that because of the opinions held by our contemporaries, they fail to recognize the profounder impulses, the more deeply lying forces that are at work and they regard contemporary events with an eye that deals with the surface alone. Anyone who penetrates but a little way into all the things that lie below the superficial happenings of our day will find both in publications and in things done by men here and there the consequences and indeed the rebirth of those impulses which first made their appearance in the early centuries of the Christian era. It is quite impossible to make people understand the importance of this re-emergence of ancient forces because they will not endure the explanation. Those who are able to study the first Christian centuries from a certain standpoint are aware what forces are now reappearing and are actively at work. I will attempt to call up before your souls certain events connected with the spread of Christianity in the first centuries of our era, for through a study of them much that is taking place around us today will be made clear. I have often drawn attention to the fact that the early Roman emperors attained initiation by force, that much they did was done under the influence of this violation of the mysteries and because of the knowledge they had of certain facts connected with the great impulses of cosmic events, and also, as explained in the last lecture, because they exploited the hidden things of the mysteries according to the individual nature of each one of them. When all this is taken into account, we realize that the entrance of the impulse of Christ into the historical life of man was not only an event of the physical plane, but we are bound to acknowledge that it was indeed a spiritual event. I have mentioned elsewhere that something much deeper than appears on the surface lies behind the fact, as recorded in the Gospels, that Christ was known to the demons. We are told that he carried out certain acts of healing, which are described in the Gospels as the casting out of evil spirits, and stresses laid ever and again on the fact that the demons that had thus been driven out had knowledge of who the Christ was. We are told, on the other hand, that Christ himself said to the demons, The time was not yet come to speak of him, that they should not, as usually translated, betray him. It can be said, therefore, that the coming of Christ was an event not known only to men. People at first may not have had the smallest perception of all that was behind this mighty event, but the demons, beings belonging to the supersensible world, recognized him for what he was. We must accept the fact that the supersensible world knew of the coming of the Christ. It was mainly knowledge of this fact that was upheld with such intensity by the wisdom-filled leaders of the early Christians and also that the coming of Christianity was not merely an earthly event, but that with it something occurred also in the spiritual world, something that was of the nature of a revolution. It is a remarkable fact that the Roman emperors, because of their forced initiation and of their knowledge of certain secrets connected with the spiritual world, had a perception of the far-reaching importance of the Christ impulse. There were some, certainly, 
who in spite of their forced initiation did not understand very much. But others understood so much that they were able to divine something of the great driving force that lay within the mystery of Christ. The most gifted and far-seeing of these emperors began to carry out a certain policy with regard to the spread of Christianity. Even Tiberius, who followed Augustus, began this policy, though perhaps the objection might be made, that Christianity had not as yet spread very far. This objection, however, does not hold, for Tiberius, through his partial initiation, knew exactly what it meant when news came from Palestine of the events taking place there. He knew what had entered into the world with the Christ impulse. You must note, therefore, that already under Tiberius the policy toward Christianity had begun which was pursued by all the initiated emperors. He announced it as his wish that Christ should be accepted as a god among the other Roman deities. The far-flung empire of Rome had pursued a special policy toward the worship of the gods, which was, in essence, the following. When a new people was conquered, the Romans received the gods of that people into their Olympus. The number of the Roman deities was thus constantly increased. The Roman policy was to absorb the peoples they conquered materially, psychically, and spiritually. The initiated Caesars were far from seeing in the various gods only what the people saw. They knew that behind the visible image of the god, real spiritual powers appertaining to the different hierarchies existed. Hence the policy pursued by them was entirely comprehensible for consciousness of the might of Rome. Let me read it again, excuse me. Hence the policy pursued by them was entirely comprehensible for consciousness of the might of Rome lay behind their acceptance of other divinities. It was not only in an outward and exoteric way that Rome accepted the worship of other gods, but she also accepted the mysteries of other peoples and united them with her own. Gradually it was accepted that to govern without having the spiritual powers recognized as the attributes of the gods was neither right nor possible. What they did, therefore, was held to be a matter of course. Tiberius desired that the power of Christ, as he conceived of it, should simply be added to that proceeding from other deities recognized by his followers. The Senate frustrated this wish of Tiberius, and it came to naught. But all the emperors who had been initiated attempted this again and again. Hadrian was one of these, but the worthies of the state resisted his policy with vigor. When we examine the policy put forward in opposition to that of the initiated emperors, we get a good idea of what happened at this most important turning point in man's earthly career. Roman writers and many others who came under her influence have written endlessly against the Christians declaring that they held sacred those things which others did not so hold, and the reverse. This means that Romans always stressed the fact that Christians were radically different in thought and feeling from Romans and indeed from everyone else. Thus the whole world looked on Christians as a peculiar people whose feeling and thoughts were entirely different to theirs. Now this might be disposed of simply by declaring it to be a calumny which would be an easy and superficial way of regarding it. We cannot regard it as a calumny, however, when we consider how many of the opinions of those who lived just before and at the time of the mystery of Golgotha have passed over into the teachings of the Christians, so far as the sound of the words go, at least. We may not value, in quotes, the sound of words over much, but for this very reason the fact must be mentioned. It might perhaps be better to say the Christians expressed their ideas in words that were incomprehensible to many of their contemporaries. One of these was Philo of Alexandria, who lived at the time at the same time as Christ, 
and who probably had, before him, the text of what was found later in Christian writings. Among the writings of Philo, we find a notable sentence which reads, quote, According to what he has been imparted to me, I have to hate that which others love, he meant the Romans, and love that which others hate, close quote. If, keeping this sentence in mind, you turn to the Gospel of Matthew, you find countless instances of agreement with the sailing, saying of Philo. One might almost say that Christianity had grown out of a spiritual aura which required people to say, quote, we love what others hate, close quote. This means that Christians upheld and outwardly declared what others denied. Indeed, the above phrase was often employed when Christian societies met in early days. It was one of their axioms. It was therefore no calumny when the Romans said, Christians love what we hate and hate what we love. The Christians, on the other hand, said exactly the same of the Romans. It can be seen from this that something absolutely different from anything that had gone before now entered human evolution. And when the whole situation is considered, one must feel convinced that what had now entered had come from spiritual worlds. Many who were contemporaries of the mystery of Golgotha, like Philo, caught fleeting glimpses of this, and each one described it as he saw it. Those parts of the gospel which are often interpreted in a way suited only to present-day conditions are first seen in their true light when we interpret them, not so as to suit ourselves, but in accordance with the whole spirit of that age. For indeed the words of the Gospels are interpreted very strangely sometimes nowadays. Much that Philo says agrees closely with the Gospels, but from the following quotation you will see that because he was not inspired to the same extent as were the evangelists later, he wrote somewhat differently. Philo wrote more in the style of a man of the world. He expressed himself in a way that did not demand so much understanding as was the case with the Gospels. In one notable sentence, Philo gives expression to something that was occupying the hearts and minds of the men of that day. He says, quote, Do not concern yourselves with registers of descent or documents by despots. Above all, do not concern yourself at all with the things of the body. Neither concern yourselves with the rights of citizenship and free birth nor with lowly birth and the purchase of freedom from slavery, but concern yourselves alone with the ancestry of the soul. Close quote. If the Gospels are read with understanding, no one can fail to recognize that something of this attitude of mind permeates the whole of them as with warmth, but warmth exalted into a specially spiritual sphere. Yet a little modern opportunist can write such words as the following, which we would do well to impress on our memories. Barras writes, quote, It is vain to seek what is beyond. Perhaps it does not exist. Compounded as we are at present, we can know nothing of it. We can leave on one side all occultism, whether inspired or spookish. Whatever form mysticism may take, it contradicts reason. But let us turn to the Church. For with great practical experience and with the authority of centuries, she formulates those ethical laws which have to be taught to the people and to children. Finally, we must turn to her, because far from giving us the results of the mysteries, she protects us from them. Silencing the voice of the sacred groves, she expounds the Gospels, sacrificing the high-sounding anarchism of the Redeemer to the needs of modern society. Close quote. It is in passages like the one I quoted from Philo that we see how from the New Testament there rings forth again and again the note which is indeed the keynote of our whole movement. When Philo speaks of the ancestry of the soul, he means a great deal. But, above all, he means something that was sharply opposed to the point of view alone considered important in the empire of Rome. There the ancestry of the body was what was considered, 
the whole social order was founded on this. Into this state of things was suddenly flung the words, quote, Pay no heed to the ancestry of the body, but look to the origin of the soul. Close quote. One cannot imagine a more thorough break with every Roman principle. It might have suited the emperors very well to place him who appeared as a new god among the many others already within their pantheon, although he struck at the very roots of their society, for by doing so the Christ God, who comprised such infinite profundities, would become one of their own gods. The initiated emperors had, however, to learn that they could not do as they wished with that which had come down from spiritual heights. When the forces of initiation work with such outward power as they were bound to do, when the command had gone forth that the emperors were to be initiated, which was the case from the time of Augustus, it was only natural that these most significant powers had a part in all their external activities. It might be said that these powers were active in every measure and in every impulse that went to the upbuilding of society, and that their intentions were seen more clearly than in the case of those initiated in the ordinary way. Suppose one of the emperors who had come in touch with this had said, Here is the Baptist, quote, Here is the Baptist with his baptism by water, through which the ether body is loosened, for this fact was naturally known to the initiated emperors, and the persons baptized have thereby gained inner knowledge concerning the spiritual world, and know that we are now standing at the most important turning point of the existence of the world, close quote, for this knowledge in particular was gained by those whose ether bodies had been loosened through immersion in the water, and the secret of the turning point of evolution was known to them. Let us suppose one of these emperors to have said, quote, I will accept the challenge, for as such it was regarded in the mysteries. I will do battle against that which has entered the world at this mighty turning point of existence, close quote. We must try to form an adequate conception of the willpower of these emperors. It never occurred to them that they might be powerless against the will of the gods. They were determined to try issues with the spiritual world impulses and to oppose with all their power the course of the world's advance. It was for this they had had themselves initiated. Such opposition has happened before. It is happening indeed at the present day. Only people are not aware of it. In connection with the hypothesis I have just constructed, I would like you to note that Lazinius, who ruled over the other part of the empire in the time of Constantine, conceived the idea of opposing himself to the heavenly powers. His desire was to carry out a test as a religious sign by which he would demonstrate before the whole external world the combat he had undertaken. In other words, he desired to bring ridicule on baptism, for it was through it that had been made so widely known the cry, quote, the turning point of the world is come. Close quote. Lysinius's idea was to throw contempt on baptism before his fellow men and so to blunt and eventually destroy the strength of the impulse toward Christianity. For this purpose a great festival was organized at Heliopolis, where it was arranged that an actor called Galicinius should be dressed in white and be immersed in water. It was intended as a play, a spectacle, to make fun of Christian baptism. Instead of this, what happened? Galicinius, having been clothed in white and dipped in the water, was then taken out of the water and, as previously arranged, should have begun to joke and make fun of it all. But note what happened. Instead of doing what was intended, Galicinius turned to the people and declared, quote, I have now become a Christian, and I shall remain such with all the power of my soul. Close quote. Lysinius had received his answer from the spiritual world. Instead of scorn being cast on baptism, the effects of it were made manifest to all, and Lysinius was therefore forced to recognize the turning point of the world. He had taken upon himself to question divine powers, to oppose the gods, 
and he had received his answer. It is hardly possible for us to form an idea of the striking effect of such an answer. At that time it was an entirely valid one, even for the heathen, and one to be taken most seriously. Even to those who were learned in the secrets of world events from another side, there came in this answer something that gave them confidence in the thoughts that sprang up from the with the spread of Christianity. The most varied customs had endured from ancient times, all of which had an occult meaning. The Sibyls spoke in the time of Antonius, and people listened to them and took advice from them. In his time, one most important oracle had declared, quote, Ancient Rome is doomed, she will not endure, close quote. Now oracles spoke in such a way that what was said might be interpreted variously and yet be understood. This oracle spoke strangely. It declared Rome will perish, and in the place where she stood of old, foxes and wolves will have their habitations and will show forth their power. This was something that had to be taken seriously. People naturally sought for a deeper meaning behind the words but they felt that here was the turning point of the world. That which had been the dominant power of Rome would flicker and die out. Foxes and wolves would shelter where she had stood, and from henceforth theirs would be the power holding sway among her ruins. Oracles often spoke ambiguously. Occasionally the aura of initiation was transmitted through an ordinary sage, so that these frequently said notable words, which could only be understood if accepted in complete accord with that age which beheld the turning point of the world's evolution. In the last lecture I spoke of Nero and showed you what this initiate emperor really thought. He desired to set the whole world in flames so that he might be present at the destruction of the world. If Rome was to come to an end, he desired, at least, that the lordship of this wide-flung empire should be his. Seneca once warned him in very remarkable words, which can only be understood if we realize that these emperors, who were in possession of the principle of initiation, believed that they were armed with divine infallibility, an honor denied to them by the Christians. Seneca, who knew no other way of bringing the matter home to a man of violence, said to Nero, quote, You have power to do many things. You know much. You can even have those persons slain whom you imagine will in any way be able to have a share in the world power that will follow on the fall of Rome. But there is one thing beyond the power of any despot. He is unable to have those butchered who come after him. Close quote. This was a deep saying. In it Seneca hinted that death would set a limit to his power. From what has been said you can see that the downfall of Rome occupied an important part in the thoughts of many at that time, even in imperial circles. And in the traditions connected with this we see how radically the Christians differed from the Romans. Something entirely paradoxical resulted from this. The Christians were distinguished by the fact that among themselves they maintained the doctrine that Rome would not perish, that her rule would endure to the end, by which was always meant the end of a cycle. Thus it was the Christians who especially upheld the doctrine that the dominion of Rome would endure, that it would survive the time of the wolves and foxes. Not that they laid claim in any way to speak as oracles, but we have to keep these varied shades of opinion in mind. Many of them have proved to have been correct. For instance, the mother of Alexander Severus, who was a pupil of Oregon, had set up for her private use a kind of pantheon for the purpose of worship. Oregon, though under some suspicion, was all the same looked on as a kind of father of the church. This lady reverenced equally in her private sanctuary Abraham, Orpheus, Apollonius of Tyana, and Christ. She considered the worship of these three as necessary and right for her salvation. 
these four, I guess, as necessary and right for her salvation. As a good, good pupil of Oregon, she felt it in no way contrary to his teaching to do so. Once you grasp the tone of mind and feeling I have tried to sketch in a few words, you will also have grasped the atmosphere of the first three centuries of our era. During this period we find the emperors, who had passed through a certain initiation, trying again and again to amalgamate Christianity with their religious system. This was true in spite of all we are told in history of the persecution of the Christians, and it continued up to the fourth century. In this century a most outstanding personality appeared in the Emperor Constantine. He was a man of great importance spiritually as well as temporally. I have shown elsewhere how spiritual influences of a very complicated nature were at work in him with regard to the guidance of Western Europe. Today we will consider him from another standpoint. He was a notable individual and a spiritual one, but his spiritual tendency was such that he was unable to find the true connection between it and the ancient principle of initiation. He shrank from what his predecessors and contemporaries had not shrank from, the extortion of initiation into the mysteries. He feared to insist on this. Therefore the Sibylline oracles and many other things that were known about the decline of the empire weighed heavily on his soul. At the same time, he knew that the Christians held the opposite tradition, that Rome would endure to the end of the world. He was well informed in all these matters, but he shrank from initiation into the mysteries, and he shrank above all from carrying the war against the Christians into the realm of the mysteries. It is important that this should be realized. What history tells of Constantine is most interesting and shows how he tried to enter into relationship with the Christians, that he desired to appear as their protector, and he endeavored, in so far as he understood it, to force Christianity on the Roman Empire. He was, however, unable to link it up with the old principle of initiation. He was faced with very great difficulties, for the Christians themselves as well as their leaders opposed this vigorously. The Christians felt, and many of them had even the insight to see, that the ancient mysteries which until then had been veiled within the temples would, through Christianity, be brought forth and set upon the stage of history for all the world to see. Christians desired that the truths known in the mysteries should be given out to the whole world and not be shut away in the temples. Those emperors who had received initiation desired nothing else at bottom than that Christianity should be withdrawn from the world behind the veil of the temples. They thought that in that case people would be initiated into Christianity as they had been initiated into the ancient secret lore of the gods. It was very difficult for Constantine to make way against that for which the Christians themselves were striving, for they understood something altogether spiritual behind the impulse which, in their opinion, entered into the whole world at the mighty turning point of evolution. We must understand that, according to them, an entirely spiritual impulse is referred to in the saying, quote, the empire of Rome will endure, close quote. This saying requires special meaning when we have under consideration what might be called the secret doctrine of the early Christians. They sought to indicate by these words what has since come to pass. I pointed out to you recently that what in truth was the deeper impulse of Rome has not yet come to an end. It lives still, and not in jurisprudence alone is this impulse to be found. It is significant that many instances have occurred which, to those who do not look deeply, appear as something new. But in truth, in one direction, nothing new has been added to the impulses which lay within imperial Rome. We have a continuation of the Roman Empire still. Even if the ancient empire exists no longer, its spirit still lives and spreads, and still its grip endures. Certain persons who have secret knowledge, 
say that what has endured to our day and ever will endure is the ghost of the old Roman Empire dwelling in our midst. This is an accepted formula for those instructed in such matters and will always be upheld by them. The Christians laid stress on and desired to draw attention to the thought that Christianity had something within it that would always fight against Rome, that what was supersensible in it would always be opposed to the materialism of the Roman Empire. And this thesis of the Christians contained a prophecy. Quote, you will now be better able to understand no, no no quote, sorry. You will now be able be better able to understand why the Senate and the Roman emperors were so worried, for the decline that was foretold was naturally associated by them with the external empire, which they saw crumble bit by bit under the influence of Christianity. Constantine was much affected by this. Though not himself initiated, he was well aware of the existence of the ancient wisdom. It had existed in the time of atavistic clairvoyance. From those days it had been carried over into later times. It had been preserved by the priesthood, but in the course of ages had gradually become corrupted. Even we Romans, so he might have addressed himself, have something that is connected with the institutions of this primeval wisdom only we have buried it beneath the social organization founded on our eternal empire. In this thought reference is made to a most important symbol, which is at the same time an imagination, and not only an imagination, but also an historic work of art of universal renown. A Roman might have spoken as follows, quote, In early days wisdom was not something thought out by men. It was a revelation from spiritual worlds. This wisdom was still possessed by the priests in the time of our early ancestors, not in Rome but across the sea in Ilion, in Troy where our forefathers dwelt. All this is told in the saga of the Psladium, the so-called image of Athena which fell from Um, I believe that's Palladium, the so-called image of Athena which fell from heaven in Troy and was preserved in a sacred place. It was later taken over to Rome and was there buried beneath a pillar of porphyry. Those who knew all that was connected with this imaginative work of art felt as follows, Our civilization, culture, reaches back to and has its source in this ancient wisdom which came down from the spiritual world. But we can no longer reach the heights to which this wisdom soared in Troy. These were the feelings of Constantine. He also felt that the later mysteries, even if he were to be initiated into them, would be of little help to him. They would not lead him to the Palladium, to the old super-wisdom. He, therefore, determined to engage in battle with the cosmic powers in his own way. If, peradventure, he might thereby do something that would save imperial Rome from destruction. He was not so foolish as to think that this could be done otherwise than within the current of certain far-reaching impulses, and he also knew that it must be done in accordance with religious ceremonies that could be carried out before the whole world. First, he determined to dig up the Palladium and have it carried back to Rome, excuse me, carried back to Troy. This plan miscarried. Instead of building a new Rome on the site of Troy, he decided to found a new city, Constantinople, transfer all power to her, thus saving declining Rome for future ages. By these means, Constantine believed he would be able to ward off the turning point in the evolution of the world. He was willing, in accordance with the Sibylline oracle, that wolves and foxes should make of Rome their dwelling place but he desired to transport the mysterious impulse of Rome to a new site and there restore it to its original vigor. Thus he formed the great plan of founding Constantinople, and this was done in the year 326. That Constantine conceived the idea of founding this city in connection with the mighty events that were then taking place and which comprised the great turning point of evolution can be seen from the fact that he chose the moment for laying the foundations of the city when the sun stood in opposition and the sign of the crab ruled the hour. 
He arranged everything carefully in accordance with cosmic signs. He desired to make Constantinople very celebrated and to transfer to her the enduring impulse of eternal Rome. He caused the pillar of porphyry, which was later destroyed by storms, to be carried across the sea. He also had the palladium dug up and transported to Constantinople, where it was once more laid beneath the pillar. Constantine treasured among his possessions some remnants of the cross of Golgotha and what remained of the nails that held it together. He had the fragments of the cross made into a sort of stand for a specially prized statue of Apollo, and the nails he had made into the rays of a crown for the head of Apollo. The statue was set up on the column of porphyry, and an inscription was engraved on it, which read somewhat as follows, quote, That which is active here will, like the sun, endure for all time, and will bear with it the might of its founder Constantine into eternity. Close quote. Such things must be taken more or less imaginatively, but with this limitation that in every particular they refer strictly to historical events. Though tradition and song have enhanced the whole history of these events, yet history lived lives in these songs. Paraphrased, the story is roughly as follows. The palladium, which is the symbol for a quite clearly defined condition of the ancient superwisdom, was preserved in strict secrecy by the priest initiates of Troy. They kept it hidden. It was brought into the light of day for the first time when, after devious wanderings, it was taken to Rome. It saw the light of day a second time when it was carried from Rome to Constantinople in accordance with the orders of Constantine. Those who accept what is told in song and story say that it will be brought a third time into the light of day when it is transported from Constantinople to a Slavian, I believe the word here is Sclavonian city. Not sure what that means. It looks like S C L A V O N I A N, but the printing is maybe poor. Okay. This tradition continues with a profound and vital impulse in many things and is widespread. Many things emerge in a purely physical aspect in our day, which have infinitely much concealed beneath this physical aspect. We can see in all this how Constantine labored against the downfall of the Roman Empire, in spite of his belief in the Sibylline oracles. His desire was to snatch Rome from her state of decline. Try to recognize in what I have told you the active soul impulses at work in the historical personality of Constantine and the important results of these impulses. Take, in connection with these, the declaration made by the leaders of the early Christians that the empire of Rome would not perish, that it would endure. Quote, the impulse we have received from it, close quote, they said, quote, will not prove delusive. It will always be there. Close quote. Here we have important things standing side by side, important things in connection with the currents active at that time in the evolution of Western civilization. In any case, you can now form a picture of the way in which imperial Rome was regarded during the first Christian centuries, and also at the time of Constantine, and can see how radically the views of these times were opposed to each other with regard to the future. In the next lecture, I have to refer to a still more important moment in evolution in connection with the spread of Christianity. This is the moment when an initiated emperor once more confronts evolving Christianity in the person of Julian, called the Apostate.